Hey everyone, um, today I'm going to carry on talking about the memory, the memory optimizations I'm doing on TEDx, which I talked about in the last stream. Um, so, one second. Um, I've got some exciting stuff to share with you um, with the memory optimizations. Um, it's gone really well, much better than I was hoping actually. Um, I think, as I said in the last stream, it's something I've been. Um, kind of thinking about the whole time we've been writing TEDx because most of the time I haven't really cared about how much memory TEDx is using. I've just thought, just get it working. I can deal with memory later. And I've always had it in the back of my mind that I can just not load up stuff that it doesn't need. You know, if you most of the files are in a huge code base, you won't be working on and you don't really need to keep all that data from memory. So my theory was I can just, just you know, keep it all on disk and not, not load it up. Um, but there was always in the back of my mind a bit of a worry that um, th that might not work. Um, but I'm pleased to say that it pretty much has. It's gone gone really well, um, which is what I'll share with you today. Um, I think in the, in the last stream I said I was going to um, sort of like page it to disk. Um, so keep a file on disk of a cache of the entire parser database, which most of it never changes, um, and just load it up on, on demand. Um, but I actually found a better way of doing it, um, and that was to use compression. Because um, what I realized was to do either the paging to disk or the compression, I need to do the same thing to start off with. I need to serialize it all, all the data to buffers and compress them. And, then either compress them or save them to disk. So I thought, you know, compression is just one line change. Let's try that first. Um, and it worked really well. Because um, as I said before, I keep two copies of the um, the token data for, for each file in memory. One copy for the main thread and the other copy for the, the parse thread. Um, so just by serializing it to disk, I'm already saving 50% of the memory um, because obviously I only have to serialize it once. Because when I serialize the disk, both of those two things will be the same. Um, so there's a 50% saving right there just by serializing it to a buffer. And then the compression of the buffer um, got it down to about 10%, um, which is pretty good. Um, so those combined, obviously it's 5%, and 5% is nothing really. I'm happy to keep 5% in memory. You know, that's that's not much at all. Um, but the benefit it gives me is that I can, if a file changes, I can reparse it and then recompress it. Whereas if I'm paging to disk, it's a little bit harder because do you append to the file? Do you rewrite the entire huge you know, four gig file each time? It's really tricky to keep updating things but if it's just compressed in memory you can just compress it and then it's gone and the other thing is compression is usually much faster than than loading stuff off disk you know in my experience about three times sort of faster to unzip something um so yeah that was what i decided to do um and let's give you some some hard numbers can you see that so yeah, memory has gone from, this is on my UE4 test project, uh, shooter game. And it was taking around 15 gig of memory uh, to load all of the parser data in. Um, and now it's gone down to five gig. So, you know, what, a third of, of what it was. So that, I'm really pleased with that. I was hoping to get it down to around four gig, but I still think I can probably manage that by compressing other stuff. And I'm not actually compressing everything I, I can do. I'm only compressing the the token data and the text data. Um, so I think I can squeeze a little bit more out of it. Um, but as a first pass, I'm, I'm really pleased with that. Um, and the cache size on disk has really gone down a lot, which is, is great. Um, so, you know, down from five gig to about 0.8 gig. Um, and one of the really good things about having a smaller cache is the startup times are much quicker. Um, so on my um, six core i7, loading up UE4, just reading the parser cache file in before the memory optimizations was taking about 25 seconds, 24 seconds. 
Um, and just by compressing all of the data, and then you're compressing the stuff that you need, like the files you've got open, you know, it got down to about seven um, seconds. Um, so that's a really nice saving, because to be honest, for me, that's the thing that really matters. I think it's for most people, how quickly after starting, opening a workspace, can you actually get to see the syntax highlighting and start editing code and stuff. Um, so feeling all inspired, <laughs> seeing seven seconds, I had a look at it in the profiler and realized I could get down, down even more. So I spent yesterday optimizing um, and threading stuff, which I'll show you in a minute. And I, I've got it down to about two and a half seconds. Um, so I'm really pleased with that. To be honest, for me, that's the biggest reason to do this memory optimization. Um, not so much how much it takes up, but the speed. I mean, if you thought 10x was fast, it's now even faster, which is which is great, because um, that's what it's all about with 10x. Um, so those are the numbers. Um, let's get to the next. So this is a graph of the full paths. So on my system, the full paths of Unreal takes um, about two and a half minutes. So this is time on the x-axis. Um, it's taking about 15 gig, and now it takes uh, 6.3 gig. But then the yellow line is the uh, restarting, loading from the cache. Um, and the difference between these two two lines is mostly fragmentation. So as you can imagine, parsing, parsing thousands of files and compressing and decompressing is going to frag memory quite a bit. Um, so, but I'm not too worried about it. I probably could sort that out by using more allocators and being a bit tidy of my memory, um, but that's not, not too bad. Um, so 5.5 gig after restarting uh, is good. Um, so as you can see, that I think I've said before, there are multiple stages in the parser. The first stage here is literally just loading the file up and parsing it in isolation. So it just parses each thread, it's parsing one, one file at a time. Um, and the nice thing about that is I can, I can load the text up, parse it, create all the token data, and then compress it down immediately. I've done that. So I only keep the number of files in memory as the number of threads they are. And the only reason this is increasing is because it's adding stuff to the global uh, parser database. You know, what I keep around for all files uh, and the string table and things like that. Um, and then when it gets to this stage, this is when it's doing the syntax highlighting. And obviously this is cross-referencing all the files, which I'll show you in a minute. And I have to make sure I um, decompress the file, obviously, before I'm going to use it. And then after a certain delay, I compress it again. So I'm only trying to keep the minimum amount of files decompressed in memory at uh, once. And that's why it's quite quite spiky here. Um, it's almost 10x faster for startup. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Everything has to be times 10, um, times 10 faster. So what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, the, the interesting thing, a bit of a coincidence, um, the time it takes to parse is almost exactly identical. So after it's done the parsing, you see this downward slope here is when it's recompressing all the files it currently has open, and then it writes out the cache, at the minimum. But the actual parse takes about the same amount of time. And it's, I, as I was doing it, there were some things I did where it was actually quite a bit faster to do the full parse because it was taking up less memory. Um, I, I didn't have, I had a few more files uncompressed, so the memory is a bit higher than this. But the parse time is actually down quite a lot. Um, and that's due to it not having to commit so much memory. Because I mean, committing 15 gig does take time. Um, whereas reusing the same memory is warm and that's going to be much faster. So, so the actual parse is about, um, I think it was 60%, excuse me, it was actually 60%, I think, of what it was. So why is it still taking up the same amount of time? Well, it's because of the, the compression. Um, actually compressing all the data obviously takes quite a bit of time. Um, and funnily enough, the time that's saved from using up less memory 
is actually taken up by the compression. So it's actually no faster, but that wasn't my goal. It wasn't my goal to make it faster. And this is only a one-off pass anyway, so I'm not too worried as long as it's no slower. Um, but there might be things I can do to improve it, such as at the moment, I'm not keeping a list of files that hit quite often so that they don't get compressed. I just compress everything after a certain amount of time. Um, so there's definitely things I can do to make sure it doesn't unnecessarily compress stuff. Um, so but I'm probably going to leave it there for now. I just want to get this, get the code tidied up, get it um, deployed and uh, see how it works for everyone else. Because um, it's, it's always going to be different on different systems. Like I said, I've got an, an i7 6 core, but a lot of people have, you know, 32, 64 cores or whatever. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. You may actually see even more of a speed up because even though the compression takes quite a long time, it will parallelize quite well, um, I think, because it won't be doing allocations and stuff. Um, so what next? Yeah, so I mentioned I optimized because um, I optimized after doing the compression, I decided to have a go optimizing the, the um, cache read again. Um, and this is the frame pro capture of that. Um, when I looked at it, because I've already, a while, ages back, I, I compressed the reading of all the files. So when it reads all thousands of files in the project, that does go across multiple threads, and as you can see, it's, it's not too bad uh, there. But the actual bulk of the time now um, is doing all of the database, the global data I was talking about, and the string tables and stuff like that. And that, that was just offending me. <laughs> There's just nothing going on on all these calls, and it's just sitting there for like five seconds, and, and you want to get going. And so I decided to have a quick go at that. Um, and what I did was I, I put each of these different, each of these is a, like a different cache in a database for fast access and stuff. So I just stuck each one of these on a separate thread and I also comp compressed them at the same time. Um, so it's loading up much less data off disk, which is obviously faster and it's doing it in parallel. Um, and as you can see, it's much better now. Um, the cores are pretty much 100% usage. Um, and there's only a little bit of waiting at the end for all the cores to finish. Um, this read CPP file data is loading up the compressed buffers out of the stream of the cache file, which obviously has to be done on the main thread. But as it's doing this, it's kicking off tasks on, on all these other cores. Um, so that's not too much of a problem. And I think I can probably get that down even more because I'm not actually compressing everything yet. There's you know, a certain percentage, probably 20, 30% more I can get, more I can compress. Um, so that would be even shorter. Um, and again, if you've got more cores, I'm hoping it will go even faster because at the moment I'm just limited by how many cores I've got because it's, it's pretty well um, utilizing all of the cores here. Um, there was a, an interesting little optimization I did here because um, when, when I do the um, file data, I use my task manager, which as you can imagine has a thread per core or for most of the cores. Um, and I started off putting putting all of these on onto the task data, right? the, the task manager, the same task manager as, as all these are on. Um, but I realized that because these aren't 100% utilizing the cores, mostly because of memory allocations, although I've tried to reduce those as much as possible, um, I realized I could use the thread pool for those tasks. And it's pretty nice because the thread pool um, is, is just kicking off a thread for each, for each task it does. And as you can see, there are only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tasks. So it just creates seven threads. And then they intersperse in into all of the gaps. Um, as you see, it's probably not great cache us usage, but it does turn out to be faster, at least on, on my system. Um, but anyway, I might, I might play around with that in the future. So it'll be interesting to see how other people with different systems um, get on with that optimization. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just show you. Stop.
startup time for my test. <coughs> so you can see the parser data comes in now and it's done in a couple of seconds. Let's try it once more with warm caches. Done. So I'm really pleased with that. I mean, because that's the thing that matters when you start up the editor, you want to be seeing the syntax highlighting as soon as possible. And what I will do to hide the fact that it doesn't, the parser data doesn't come in instantly is I will just save out the syntax highlighting data for open, open files. And then when it starts up, it'll be instantly there, even though the parser data hasn't quite come in yet. So I'll just get rid of that horrible sort of change of colors you get as it flicks in. Um, but anyway, that's the main thing. It's much better than before. On my system, that was about 30 seconds, as I said, or 20, 25 seconds. Um, so I'm really pleased with that. Um, let's go back to the slides. Uh, where are they? That is that one, isn't it? Yeah, so let's talk a bit about why it was tricky um, and get into the actual details, which I'm sure is what you're interested in. Um, this is kind of how I visualize the parser. Now, at the moment, I'm, talking, I'm going to be talking about the full parse, but it applies to incremental parsers as well. Um, I imagine the files like this. I have a very visual imagination, so um, bear with me. Um, and say you've got a line like this, just some random line I've chose, chosen, and you want to find out what um, this... Uh, what type that is, so I know what type to colour it, or if you do, go to definition on it or something. Um, and obviously, to do that, you, you need to first find this function here, um, and that will probably be in another file somewhere else. But before you can even find that function, you need to find out, oh, what what's this? Um, so you need to do go to definition on that first. So you find out that's a text editor UI object, um, which is, again, is in another file somewhere else. These, these are all files, these circles. It'll make sense in a minute. Um, and then you have to do, um, once you've got that, obviously you can find the function and then you need to find the function return value, which might be in another file again, because the function might be in a header, the return value might be in the source and the return value is a point struct in this case. And a point struct is in a different file again. So as you can see, to work out this one y value, what, what type it is, you might have to hit, say, five or six different files um, to get it. Um, so the way I kind of visualize that is, imagine if you start here, this is the file we're parsing. Um, and then, like I said, to get the first thing, it has to work out what type. It has to find the type of text editor, which would be in textedit.h. Um, and then it will go somewhere else, like I said, to another file. Say, get the function, and this is another file again. Uh, that might be the header file, which contains the function. And then it has to get return type, and a return type is a point struct, which again is in point.h, which is another file. So this is how I kind of visualize. This is one thread starting here, trying to find what y is and going various files. Yeah, so hopefully you get, get the idea. Um, and then obviously you've got multiple threads doing this at the same time. Uh, so another thread might be parsing this file, which is a completely different file, but it happens to have the same function, um, but it needs, sorry, it, has to, it happens to say get a different function in the same file, in this file, and then the return type is something different again, so it has to go to a different file and go to a different file. Uh, and again, if you've got multiple threads, as you can imagine, it gets pretty complex with different threads starting at different points sort of going to different files in turn um, and to try and resolve all the parser data. And the interesting thing to notice is each thread can hit the same file, like this one. You know, it's hit by two threads. Uh, this one's hit by two threads. This one's hit by two, etc. So as you can imagine, it gets pretty complex. And that's how I had to write the... Um, the shared recursive shared locking class that I did. Um, so the reason it needs to be shared locking 
is because all of these operations are read only. So at the moment, let's say we've got no write operations going on. Nobody's editing the files at this moment and it's just doing the full parse and it's all read only data. So I take a shared lock on each file. So when I get to a file and I want to work out what a type is, I take a shared lock on it, a shared read lock, sorry. Um, and that allows multiple threads to come in at the same time. Otherwise it'd be horrendously slow and the whole thing would just be locked up and it might as well be single threaded. Um, and then if you edit a file while this is happening, which is possible, because remember this has got to work in the incremental case where you're editing code, um, you have to lock a file exclusively uh, for write uh, to make sure that um, shared uh, the shared reads, no shared reads are going on at that time and to make sure they don't start while you're editing a data, obviously. Um, and the reason it needs to be recursive, which I haven't actually shown on this diagram, is you can get cycles. So as you can easily imagine, I'm sure, you know, you you want to find a type of a function and it goes to a header file and then it, to resolve the type, it has to go back to the source file, so which you're already in. So you can easily have cycles and the cycles can be incredibly complex, you know, cycles which go round and round and it's just insane. Um, so I needed to make it recursive because the the Windows um, shared rewrite lock is great and it's really, really fast, but it's not recursive. So I wrote a wrap around that, which is recursive, which I think I shared a while back on my pure dev blog, if anyone's interested. Um, it's not particularly fast, but it does the job and it allows this crazy mess to happen um, without without either just locking and stalling everything or just deadlocking the whole system. Um, so yeah, on a, on a good day, it looks like that. On a bad day, it looks like that. And <laughs> my head wants to explode. Because <laughs> you imagine you've got thousands and thousands of files, like three, four, five thousand 5,000 files or whatever. And some people have like, you know, 128 threads all hitting this data in each file. And it's got to be safe. It's got to be thread safe. And it's got to not deadlock. Um, which is really hard. Um, anyway, most of this problem was solved a while back when I initiated the parser, but the reason I'm recapping it now, um, let's go back to a more sane thing. The reason I'm recapping now is because what I want to do is when one of these files is in, in use, say, you know, for example, um, this one not in use, I can compress it. Um, and that's easy, you know, that's simple. Nobody's using it, I just compress it. I put a lock while I'm compressing it and, and the world is good. Um, but obviously in threading, you've always got to deal with the worst case. Um, and the worst case is that when I come, when I decide to compress it, somebody else wants it. Um, and, <coughs> and that turned out to be quite a tricky problem. Um, it's hard to know how to exactly explain it, um, but I tried a number of different ways of doing it. Because what I, what I didn't want to do initially was to add in another lock, because I've already got two main locks here, and they're the ones that can easily deadlock. So I didn't want to add a third lock in. So I was trying to do it with the locks I had and say, okay, take the, the exclusive lock I've talked about when, say, you're editing a file, and just use that when I'm compressing. Um, but that didn't work out for a number of reasons. Um, and I did find I was getting deadlocks um, because it's it's very, the other thing is my code doesn't need, it's well overdue a refactor. And I've got two classes, like I said, the main thread class and the, the parse thread class, and they really should be one class. So that was making it a little bit more tricky as well. Um, and I'm, I, I'm looking forward to doing a refactor at some point, but but never refactor when you're doing a big change. So I had to make it work with what I've currently got. Um, so the way it works is um, the decompression needs to happen immediately. Um, so because most of this is threaded, it doesn't matter if I store the thread that it's on. I, can, I just, I need the data right now. I'm gonna de decompress it myself and not wait for anyone else to do it. So whenever a thread comes along, finds a file that's compressed, it will decompress it immediately. Um, and then when it's finished with it, it will put it onto a queue, 
which says, okay, in 200 milliseconds, you can compress this. Um, but then if another thread, thread comes along and wants it, it will reset that. It will say it will, when it comes to decompress it, even if it's uncompressed already, it will, it will cancel any other compressions that are due. Um, so it's a bit of a different system than editing code where you need exclusive lock on it. Um, you can, because the nice thing about this is you can cancel the async compression that's going to happen. Um, so what I do is I have a reference count. I'll show you the code in a minute. Um, I have a reference count and that says whether anything can start a compression. Obviously, if it's got a reference count on it, it means the thread is doing something. Um, and I did actually end up adding in another lock, this time just a mutex. It didn't need to be shared, which is nice. So it's just a simple mutex which handles the compressed, decompressed logic. So there are lots of threads all saying, compress me, no, decompress me at the same time. So I obviously needed a lock for that. But that's just a simple non-recursive mutex and that, that's fine. So I realized that that wouldn't deadlock. Um, and the, the key moment was realizing I needed that reference count. So as soon as the thread comes in and, and locks and says, I need this decompressed, it, increment, it cancels any decompresses and increments the reference count, which means that no other thread will try and compress it while it's got that reference count. And then obviously it, it decreases the reference count when it's finished with it. Um, so as I said, at the moment, it's just got a 200 millisecond um, delay which is really simple, but it seems to work pretty well. Um, I will be adding a sort of a heat map thing where it, as files are accessed more often, they'll have an incrementing value, which will decrease over time. And that will stop because a lot, of, as you can imagine, a lot of headers like string.h or something is used all the time. And you never want to really compress that. So what I'll do is the more a file is used in the parser, um, I'll, I'll make sure that is never compressed by giving it that value. And that will help with files when you're editing code. Um, it will make sure they'll never be compressed, um, which is what you want. So yeah, that's working pretty well. I'll quickly show you some code. Let's <coughs> open up. So the, the nice thing about um, working on Unreal is that any other project after that loads instantly. <laughs> As you can see, it didn't even have time to show you the progress bar on loading up the cache. <coughs> so yeah, I mean, it should be even faster than it was before. Um, Right, where should we start? Let's make that a bit bigger for you. Oh, that was a bit slow. Just loading in the fonts, I guess. Right. So the, these are the compression stuff I've added. Obviously it's got ball whether it's compressed or not. Um, this is the lock count I was talking about. So each time a thread is doing stuff with a file, it increases that, um, which stops anything else trying to compress it. Uh, that's the buffer of compressed data. Um, that's mute it, the new lock I talked about. Um, but I needed just to synchronize the compress and decompress calls um, because they might be having it on different threads. And the, the compress is actually done on a, a separate thread, um, um, which is actually done as a high priority task. So I insert it at the head of the task manager queue. Um, and that's otherwise, if it went to the end of the queue, it would wait until all files have been parsed before starting to compress. So I realized I had to insert that as a high priority task um, just to get the, the memory saving. Um, and the decompressed task, yeah, so I made, when you, I mean, the decompress is actually very fast. So to decompress most files, it takes about 
two or three milliseconds, which is easy fast enough that you don't actually notice it come in. But for a bigger file, it can take like 30 milliseconds, I found in some rare cases. So what I did was I made the um, decompress for when you edit a file, or when you open a file asynchronous, which may mean you may see on a really large file, the syntax highlighting come in a split second after um, you open it. Um, but that's better than, than stalling the editor, I think. Um, but hopefully you won't see that very often. Um, so let's look at that. Yeah, so update lines um, is what's called when you edit a file. Actually, yeah, that's wrong, isn't it? It shouldn't be doing the async compress there. It should already be decompressed at this point. Um, it should be doing the async compress here, which is good. So yeah, that actually won't be needed because it should never be compressed at that point. So when you open a file, it says this file is high priority and then starts an async de decompress on it, which like I said, Usually only takes a millisecond or two, but could, could take 30 milliseconds. Um, and then when you close a file, obviously it does the async compress. Um, so it's not needed anymore. And this is all done in the background, obviously. Um, so let's go to the parse thread. So this is stuff that's parsing on, on a separate thread. Update task is the main thread entry point um, where it does all the, the parsing. Um, oh yeah, this is an interesting little thing. So somewhere it does add task, start update task. Um, so when you when you edit code, um, it updates the CPP file there and then on that thread and then kicks off the parse thread to do stuff. And this is the thing that kicks off the thread to do stuff. Um, um, what I do is I take a decompress lock here to stop, and this will cancel, like I said, any of the compressions that are happening. Um, but I pass in false because I don't want to decompress it here. Um, and the reason for that is this is happening on the main thread. So the CPP file is all on the main thread. Parse thread is on the parse thread. Um, and I don't want to decompress it here, but I do want to cancel any compressors that might be in, in progress. Um, and then where I just was in update task, ensure decompressed is actually what does the decompression. Um, and as I said, this is this is on the parse thread, so you won't actually notice that happening. Um, and then at the end, it should be doing, oh yeah, this is uh, yes, another complication. When the parse thread is finished, it needs to update the CPP file data, which is on the main thread. Um, so I do that by sending events. So as I'm as I'm parsing the data and filling in the token data, I'm sending events back to the CPP file. Um, but obviously, I can't just compress it here when I finished um, because the CPP file might be still dealing with these events. Because when I compress, obviously I compress the CPP file and the parse thread file. It's all it's all one. Like I said, these two files should probably be one file, really. Um, it's a little bit confusing having them separate um, because you've got all this communication back and forth between them. But anyway, I can't I can't compress it when I finish parsing. And so I realized the easiest way to do that was just to create a new event, um, which is called release decompress lock. Um, which release um, decrements that reference count I was talking about, which means it can get compressed at some point in the future. Um, and that worked really well. Um, so that was one of the things that made it made it safe. Um, the other thing, and go back to CPP file. What did I do? Yes, I added uh, a decompress scope class. So as you can imagine, just compresses it in the constructor, well, takes the decompressed lock in the constructor and releases it in a destructor. Um, so as I said, this is asynchronous. It happened 200 milliseconds time if nobody else has cancelled it. Um, so what I did was I literally just went through 
this class and every um, public function, I just stuck a decompress scope in there. Um, so it cancels all compressions, increments the ref account, so nothing else can compress it. And then at the end, schedules it for decompression if no, nobody else is, has used it. And the nice thing is all of these functions are used by the parser um, to get various different bits of information. And it can all be blocking. So if this file is compressed, it will block, but that's fine because this is one of the parse threads. So it can just decompress it there and then. Um, and yeah, it's all good. So I think that covers pretty much everything on, on the decompression side. Um, don't think there's much. Much interesting to see in the compress function. It's just as you'd expect, really. Um, so this is the compress lock I was talking about. So just to make sure I'm not trying to cancel a compression or schedule another compression or decompress at the same time, I just create the, take this lock. Um, and if it's not compressed um, and the count is zero and I haven't cancelled it, um, then take the exclusive lock. So this is the exclusive lock I was talking about in here that I use for editing the file so I can be sure that no other thread is reading it at this current time. And then I just literally create a memory stream. Um, yeah, take an exclusive lock on the parse thread, compress the parse thread data, and then compress the data I've got. Well, actually, no, I haven't got any data here to compress. It's all in the parse thread. Um, so yeah, then I, then I compress it. And then I clear all of the text and token data I've got. And also importantly, clear the allocators. So these are allocators I use so that to keep it really fast in a, so I'm not hitting the main allocator from all, all these different threads and to keep the memory contiguous as well, which keeps it fast. So I've just, just got the text allocator and the token allocator and I clear those and they actually do decommit all of the memory. Um, so hopefully I get most of it back. Um, and then compress is true and then a reverse obviously in the decompress. And I have a, uh, an event people can subscribe to so that when the decompress is finished then I can update the syntax highlighting and stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So 42% compress. Yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier with the, um, I, I just did a profile actually before, before the stream and it is spending 42% of the entire parse time. Um, Compressing, compressing the data, <laughs> which is crazy, really. But most of that's because it's doing multiple times. Like I said, because there are multiple pass, passes on the file, it will load up the file, do some stuff, and then compress it again, and then uncompress it, do some stuff, and compress it again. So it's probably compressing each file about three times in this process. Um, but I have to do that, really. Otherwise, you get a big spike of memory where it would load all files in at once. Um, um, so, like I said, it's taking the same amount of time, so that's a price I'm, I'm willing to pay. Um, um, I've talked about the read cache time. Oh, the other thing, switching configs, um, that's greatly improved. So, let's bring up Unreal again. Um, are you using classic Zlib for compression? Yes, yeah, just standard Zlib. And just the normal compression level. I haven't played around with different compression levels yet. Um, and decompress is already easily fast enough. But it'd be nice if the compress wasn't quite so slow. So I may try dropping the level. I think it's not six at the moment. I may try dropping it one or two. See if I can get a slightly faster uh, compression. Um, Oh yeah, switching configs. So switching configs now is a lot faster. Let's see if it's working. 
Let's go to, I think I had debug editor cached. Um, oh, damn it, it's doing a full pass. Anyway, I'll talk while it's doing a full pass. But the nice thing is that um, obviously, uh, I think I, I mentioned in the last stream that I put in, um, it now uses the the parser cache instead of reparsing everything. Because I think about a month ago, it was taking about two and a half minutes to switch configs and get syntax highlighting because it was reparsing every time you switch configs, which was crazy, obviously. Um, and then I made it use the parser cache, which was obviously much faster, but that still took like 25 seconds when you switch config and you've got a sort of blank syntax highlighting while it's doing that, which wasn't great. Um, but now, um, obviously, as I said, the reading the parser cache only takes two and a half seconds. Um, you can switch configs and see the syntax highlighting in two and a half seconds. But even better than that, because it uses up so much less memory, I can overlap the old and the new database. So before I had to totally tear down the old database and release all the memory, which took ages for 15 gig, um, before I could load up the next 15 gig from the parser cache. So you get a long time with no syntax highlighting at all. Whereas now, because it's taking up so much less compression, um, I can overlap them. So I keep the current database in memory. Um, as you can see now, it's parsing the entire database for this, um, this config, which I haven't done yet. Um, but I've still got the syntax highlighting um, from the old config, which is good enough, you know, for most cases. Um, and then hopefully in a minute when it's finished, finished parsing, I'll be able to show you switching configs. Um, and it should be, you know, fairly seamless. Um, I'm hoping. And the other nice thing with the compression, the, um, as I said, the cache is much, much smaller. Um, so I think they were about, for my Unreal test, they were about four gig, four, four and a half gig, I think. Um, and now it's, it's um, you know, 0.8 gig. Um, because there, there's now, if you look in your, pos in your cache folder, there'll be a cache per config. Um, and I, I don't think I deleted the old one, so you can actually go in and delete it if you want to free up some disk space. Um, and as you can see, it's just writing this config now. Um, writing does take quite a long time, which is a bit annoying, especially when you're shutting down and stuff. Um, and I haven't threaded that at all yet, so that can all be threaded at some point. Um, but yeah, it didn't take too long. So yeah, you can see the new config file. So if I switch back to the other config, with any luck. Syntax highlighting stays, reads the cache, and this is the new config, absolutely seamless. Um, and everything in theory is updated. I haven't given it a lot of testing yet, but it should just work. Um, so unlike some other editors I won't mention, I have a, an actual stall of the entire UI while it switches config. You should just be able to switch and carry on working without even thinking about it. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased with that. And hopefully you'll find it useful and uh, a better experience. Um, I think that's everything. So yeah, let me know if you've got any other questions. Um, like I said, I'm still, I'm still working on this. Um, and I, I've done all the hard stuff. I've, you know, I'm, I've convinced myself that it is possible and it's all working, it's all good. I've just got a few things to tidy up. Uh, I noticed earlier that the, um, oh, where is it? The find references um, for, um, let's try something else. For files that aren't open yet, for some reason the source text editor isn't updating. Um, it's weird because it's using the same system as normal files do. I think it's just not getting that event I talked about where after it's decompressed, 
um, it has to up do a refresh on the syntax highlighting. So I think it is all working. Um, it's just not updating. And I, I will change the color from red at some point, but that's just to make it obvious for me uh, when, I, when the parser data hasn't come in. The other thing I might do actually is um, not compress the syntax highlighting data because I could probably store this data in a very compact form for every line. I just need to store, you know, uh, an index and a length and a color or a index into a lookup table or something. And I could probably store all of the syntax highlighting color data for, you know, the entire code base in just say, I don't know, 50 meg or 100 meg or something. And that might be worth it because then I won't have to, um, you know, when I do find references or something, I won't have to decompress each file because as you're going through this, this is decompressing all of those files and probably using up more memory than, than you need to. So it'd be nice not to have to decompress just for that. So I'm probably gonna look at just storing the syntax highlighting data in a non-compressed form depending on how much memory it takes up. Um, and then that'll put less stress and strain on us on the system. Um, so yeah, I've got a few things to tidy up. Um, I need to do some more checking that there definitely aren't any deadlocks still in there, and but I haven't had any for, any for days now. So I'm pretty, pretty confident now. Um, and I haven't actually done any editing <laughs> in it yet. So, I mean, it shouldn't, shouldn't matter because at this point it's uncompressed and it's not gonna be any different than normal. And then, you know, like if you do go to definition, it, you, you didn't even notice, but it did decompress that file before it showed it. Um, and it does that on demand. And if I close that file, it will compress it in the background. So yeah, it's all really fast. It seems to be using much less memory. Um, and yeah, the startup time is, is drastically improved. So what I'm really looking forward to hearing is how people get on with their different systems. Like, you know, with people with higher core counts, does it get better or, or worse even? Because as we know, some things don't scale well when you put them across 128 cores or something. Um, so I haven't got any other systems to test on here. Um, so it's really valuable having your input. So what I'll probably do is I'll I'll put a link up to this build on the <clears throat> on the Discord for subscribers. Um, and if anyone else wants to have it, then just contact me on on the website, um, and I'll send you a link. But it's probably not ready yet to use for general development. I need to just check that I haven't totally broken anything else. Um, but I'm hoping it should be only be like maybe a day or two more work um, before I can check this in. Um, like I said, there's still more I can do. Um, there's still more stuff I can compress. There's there's stuff that I haven't even looked at in the main parser database, which I haven't compressed yet, which is a huge chunk. Um, so I probably could get it down to around four gig, which is my original target. Um, but I'm happy enough with this now that I just want to get it tidied up um, and then and get it checked in and deployed so that people can start using it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Um, and I'm really excited to, to let you try it. Um, any plans on including a command line panel would be useful for doing Git stuff. Um, oh, we see, yeah, like, like, a, like a DOS command, um, um, like that. Um, yeah, that, that'd be fairly easy to do, I imagine. Um, shouldn't, shouldn't be too much at all. Um, I don't think I've actually got it on the list. I, I'll add that to, to the Git issues. Because um, I've, I've got obviously a 10x um, command prompt where I can, where you can type stuff in here. Um, um, so various commands you can do. Um, but yeah, yeah, command prompt is, is definitely a good, good idea. So yeah, let me know if you have any other questions. Let's see if there's anything else.
yeah, I know VS Code has it. I haven't actually used it in that, but um, I think it's a very good idea. So just one less thing for the program to switch to, isn't it, when you're, when you're working? Um, Yep, no problem at all. I'm glad you're glad you you're liking it. Um, and yeah, I did want to say uh, thanks to all my subscribers. Um, without all of you, I probably wouldn't be working on tax still because, as you can imagine, it's a big project and I'm totally self-funding. Um, and the thing that gets me out of bed each morning is knowing that I've got people using 10x for their day-to-day -day work already and I think that's absolutely amazing um, and it really inspires me and uh, makes me want to carry on and, and makes me realise that it is actually something that is useful to people. Um, so yeah, if, if anyone else is watching this and you feel like subscribing to me, um, then please do. You can find it on the, on the 10x website. Um, and anything you can spare really, really does help. Um, so, hmm, should be able to click on that. Maybe that's why people aren't subscribing because the button doesn't work. Anyway, you can click on that one. Um, so yeah, thanks again to everybody who does subscribe and support me. It's great, we've got a good little community going on the Discord. Um, so yeah, let me know. Like I said, I'll send out a link so you can try out this build for yourself. But like I said, probably the best not to use it for your actual proper work yet. It would just be interesting to see how quickly it starts up and, and pauses and stuff. Um, and then hopefully, like I said, in a couple of days' time, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, I'll have it ready for everyone. I'll, I'll do a general release, assuming there are no, no major problems. Um, so after this, after, when I've done the memory, I'm actually getting close to the end of beta. I've got the end in sight now. And, um, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think the only other big things I've got to do, um, I still haven't done a find in files, um, you know, the, the standard kind of search all files on disk type of thing that most, well, all editors have, Turex doesn't have yet. Um, so I need to do that. And I also need to look at the docking which at the moment is a bit annoying, um, the way you have to just kind of pause and wait for it to do stuff and then it docks when you don't want it to dock and stuff. So I need to look at the docking. Um, but apart from that, well, apart from all the the um, GitHub issues, which are increasing um, all the time, but a lot of them are very minor issues and I'm, I'm looking forward to just blitzing through them um, how many have we got 418 <laughs> yeah so that's quite a lot that's probably a good six months work at least um, but anyway not all of these have to be fixed to come out of beta so my focus now is just to get it feature complete at least for beta um, and then I'll start working through as many of these issues as I can and we'll, we'll go from there. But the end is in sight now, which is great. Um, so yeah, if there aren't any more questions, um, I'll sign off and I'll see you again next time and probably in a couple of weeks time. Okay, All right, bye for now.